Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Has Israel committed domicide in Gaza? Let's get to the bottom line. Neighborhood by neighborhood and mosque by mosque and school by school, Israel has systematically crushed the civilian infrastructure in Gaza. Over the course of the war, we've seen so many homes and buildings targeted that we may have become just desensitized. And besides the accusation of genocide, which is the attempt to destroy a nation, UN experts have been warning that Israel has carried out scholasticide, the destruction of the education system, and domicide, the destruction of people's homes. According to international law, the wanton destruction of property that's not justified by military necessity is a war crime. But even if it is a war crime, how does that translate to the more than 2 million Palestinians in Gaza who have to live in an area that has become completely uninhabitable? Today we're talking with Balakrishnan Rajakopal, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing and Associate Professor in the Department of Urban Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor, thank you so much for joining us today. Look, I, I want our audience to understand this word, which many of them may not have heard before, domicile. Tell us what it means and how does it stack up in the world of war crimes? Well, the crime of domicile is one which involves uh, the systematic or widespread destruction of housing. Uh, housing destruction on an individual basis for example, when the destruction of a house is not justified as a military objective, is already a war crime under the Geneva Convention. So that is a war crime. So it if, is a war if crime. it is a target and there's no military reason or rationale, that is a war crime in and of itself. That's right. It is already a war crime to destroy a house if there is no military justification. Uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, gave uh, a public interview uh, at, in Cairo uh, after he visited Rafa last year when he said exactly the same thing. He said houses are protected objects, hospitals are protected objects, schools are protected objects. So there are many that are protected objects under the Geneva Conventions and houses are among them. The problem is this. Houses individually when they destroy are of course war crimes. But if you destroy an entire swathe of neighborhood or an entire city for that matter, is that a crime? And in international law, it may be a crime if you do it with the objective of obliterating or erasing a people in whole or in part. That's a definition of genocide under the 1948 Genocide Convention. But suppose you didn't have that intention or the intention couldn't be established clearly, but you still engage in large-scale destruction of housing, then is that still a crime or not? And I would like to actually advocate for the recognition of such large destruction of housing, whether or not it is genocide. Uh, I'm not saying that it is not a genocide in the case of destruction of housing in Gaza. It very well is. But on the other hand, even if it isn't in right. any conflict, it should still be recognized as a crime, and that's domicile. And you want to have it written into the, what, the Geneva Convention? You want to have it written into law? I would like states to consider recognizing domicile as a crime under law, hmm. but it won't be under the Geneva Conventions, but it will be through the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which already lists several acts which constitute crimes against humanity, and there is no reason why it cannot be amended to include domicile. Now, Israel says that October 7th triggered a need to defend itself, to go after and eradicate Hamas. Uh, Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu has been very overt and very public about that being the mission at hand. You, I think, don't buy the, the, the way that mission is playing out with regard. So where does the equation come apart with what Netanyahu is saying and doing and what we're seeing on the ground in Gaza? Well, if there was a military justification to respond to the attacks of October 7th, which were horrendous in nature, of course, one would have to see a military operation. But what we have seen instead is an extermination campaign, not a military operation. Entire life of Palestinians in Gaza has been completely obliterated. More than 70% of the homes have been destroyed. And all, all the universities standing in Gaza have been destroyed. Almost all schools have been destroyed, educational institutions. 
uh, religious institutions, public buildings, including the Palace of Justice, have been blown up. And the way in which this destruction has been carried out is not always through a military campaign, for example, responding to use of force by Hamas or other actors, but instead, Israeli units moving in and using controlled explosives, using detonation to actually destroy neighborhood by neighborhood. So to me, it doesn't look at all like uh, what has been happening in Gaza actually is a military campaign. Mm. It's something else. Where have you seen this kind of destruction before in such a short time, in such a confined space? I have never seen such destruction in any conflict. And that actually goes all the way back to World War II with the destruction of Dresden or with the destruction of Rotterdam. It took much longer and fewer percentage of houses were actually destroyed in Rotterdam, for example. And if you actually fast forward to the destruction of Aleppo or Homs during Syrian war or the destruction wrought on Fallujah during the Iraq campaign uh, or what we are seeing in Myanmar or the destruction of uh, Ukrainian cities by Russia, including you know, the destruction of Mariupol, which has been the most extensive, uh, they all happened over a longer period of time, number one and fewer percentage of houses got destroyed. And most crucially, here is a big difference. Those people had a place to flee to, whereas Gaza is a confined, confined space, and the population runs from one corner to another corner, and they have to return to the same place that has been bombed. They're running around in circles. That's extremely unprecedented. I've never seen it in any conflict. But any city like this, when you look at the before and after, it's a complex system. You have zoning, you have homes, you have schools, you have mosques, you have hospitals. You have a complex interaction of those systems. So it's not just the number of buildings that we're taking out. It was that the complex system in a, in a whole area was completely wiped out. We've been talking a lot about the day after and how to bring this back. And I'm just interested in from your own experience, does anything come back? If the, you, you've talked about Dresden, you've talked about other cities uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Rotterdam and others that were wiped out. How, what, what's our experience in terms of returning a healthy, functioning society back to a place that has had this kind of devastation? Well, you're quite right that uh, what has been destroyed uh, is not just houses alone, it's not just uh, universities alone, although individually it's very shocking. But the whole society has been destroyed. The whole economy has been destroyed. The economic system has been destroyed. The political system, of course, has been destroyed. And society has been shattered completely. And uh, what is needed in terms of rebuilding is much more challenging in Gaza because of the extent, scale, and the ferocity of destruction. But it is also more challenging because unlike, for example, say, Rotterdam after World War II, the big difference between then and now is that World War II had an ending date. It ended. Mm -hmm. And then you could begin the process of rebuilding with the guarantee that when you rebuild, what you actually do will continue to stand. The problem in Gaza is that every few years we have seen very large-scale armed conflict break out because of the continuing occupation. So the basic message I'd like to convey is this. Until the occupation ends, I don't see a replication of what has been possible in the case of any other cities that have been destroyed in the past. Now, there is some journalism out there that has followed uh, an Israeli army uh, division, the 98th Division, um, 8219 Commandos. I don't know if you've seen this reporting in journalism. It's very, very hard to watch because in it you see lots of different social media, essentially self-reporting by members of this, of this military unit, uh, someone who says we've actually become addicted to blowing things up. I mean, I'm interested in your observations about this kind of activity. Can you convey to our audience what that journalism is showing in real time with real video on social media that Israel is proud of? Yes, uh, there have been uh, very well-documented, highly rigorously reported um, stories with the involvement of specific units mm. that have carried out controlled demolitions and, and uh, brought down entire neighborhoods and often uh, taking particular glee in their act and posting videos, for example, on social media, uh, celebrating what they are doing. Mm. Uh, and uh, the stories that have been published, 
involved interviews with the commanders and the soldiers of these units, where they themselves confessed to what has been done. This particular unit, 8219, is documented as having been involved in controlled demolitions of vast sections of housing in Khan Yunis and a number of other locations. And what it shows to me more than anything else is that, again, this is an extermination campaign. This is a campaign of annexation. Because when you actually render a place uninhabitable for a population, by erasing all signs of life, including their homes, their food systems, their agricultural lands, greenhouses, their religious buildings, their uh, public records, then basically there is nothing to return to. So the only logical sort of option that you leave for such a population, or so the thinking probably goes in the minds of Israeli planners, is that the population gives up and moves on and the land becomes theirs. And so to me, I see this destruction of Gaza as simply a logical extension of the unfortunate situation of prolonged annexation and occupation. While you can call something ethnic cleansing, that doesn't necessarily stop it or get to the accountability question. So uh, do you feel people will be held accountable for what we're seeing? As far as accountability for what Israel is doing is concerned, I see three levels of accountability that are possible. One is, of course, accountability at the level of international justice. And there we see the International Court of Justice, as well as the International Criminal Court, grappling with the crimes mm. and the serious violations and breaches of international law that Israel has committed, including mm. the question of the legality of the long-term occupation, which is also before the ICJ right now. A second level at which I see accountability happening is in the courts of other countries, including the courts of this country, the United States, where, for example, there is an ongoing case happening before the Ninth Circuit, mm. as we speak, about the legality of supplying weapons by the United States to Israel uh, because of its incredibly damaging impact on children. Mm. We have also seen the courts of other countries that have been used, including, most famously, the use of Dutch courts to actually prevent the shipping of F-35 aircraft parts to Israel. And that is a binding judicial order. The third level at which I see accountability happening is in world public opinion. Mm. And world public opinion, I think that has already seen the reality of what's happening and is actually ready to hold people accountable. And that accountability will not be legal alone. It will be a long historical accountability which will follow Israel and those who committed crimes in the state of Israel for a very long time. And I don't know they realize that this is not a burden they can shake off easily. Is there another form of domicide going on in the West Bank? You've talked about extermination policies and we've seen very, very brutal destruction of facilities. But in the West Bank, there's also a kind of land grab uh, if you will, uh, underway with a lot of settlers' movements and others coming in and taking, uh, destroying homes, you know, of, of those that resist. And so is, is, that, an, is that also in uh, the UN uh, rapporteur's report as, a, as an area of concern? That's a great question. Actually, it completely is covered within the definition of domicile. In mm -hmm. fact, what has been happening in uh, occupied Palestinian territories, that includes, of course, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, is a decades-long campaign of domicide. And the main tools mm. have not always been war. They have been the use of punitive home demolitions, for example, mm. or denial of home building permits for Palestinians in Area C. Right. Or they have actually involved systematic periodic campaigns, warfare every two or three years that actually destroys large numbers of houses. And increasingly in West Bank, it also involves destruction of houses and other uh, objects by settlers, mm -hmm. while the Israeli uh, governing authority and the military stands aside and does nothing to impose accountability. So domicide as a crime against humanity has been committed in all of these occupied territories. And frankly, unlike war crimes, which requires that they be committed during the course of an armed conflict, Crimes against humanity or even genocide don't require 
that an armed conflict be going on. They can be committed during peacetime as well. What do you need for the legal architecture of domicide to be, to have more grit and traction? I mean, I'm very convinced in the cases you've talked about historically, uh, but we've also watched the destruction of, you know, cultural institutions, mosques, hospitals, as we said, the social ecosystem uh, in this case. Uh, but domicide to many people is a very new term. Um, your role is a new one uh, in the minds of many. What is missing out there among your colleagues and peers uh, among those people in the international uh, legal uh, framework and network um, that would help elevate the concern and the place on the kind of global dashboard of human rights of domicide? I think it's a complicated question because I think part of the problem is that people tend to see a house as simply an asset, hmm. uh, mostly as a property. So the idea being that if your house is destroyed, you can replace it as long as there is compensation. But a house is not simply a financial asset, right. although it involves a lot of money to purchase a house. Often it's the largest investment that most families make in their lives. On the other hand, a house is also a repository of your memories. Mm. And that's actually a lot more than simply monetary value. You value it for all kinds of other reasons. Uh, and unfortunately, there is very slow recognition of this larger sense in which a house should be understood. Mm -hmm. It's understood more among certain people, certainly the war affected people that understand it very well. You think of your house only in terms of finance, but only when it is destroyed, you realize that you miss it for other reasons too. And as far as the professional communities are concerned, I'm afraid that among the legal community in particular, there is very slow recognition of the fact that when large-scale destruction of any economic and social rights take place, it could be destruction of your food system, for example, your right. agriculture. Olive trees have been destroyed by the hundreds of thousands in the occupied territories. Are they war crimes or not? Mm. And I would say that they should be if they are not. And unfortunately, I don't think that there is adequate recognition because international law is not quite cut out yet to recognize large-scale destruction of housing or food or uh, education, for that matter, as standalone crimes by themselves. There is quite a lot of willingness to focus on so, killing, torture, et cetera, et cetera, right. but not on destruction so of material So what's the gap between that, I don't know, Western notions of liberalism and law and the way law really works in the third world? I know you've been part of this network called the Third World Approach to International Law Network. And I, I get the sense that there's this gap in understanding and application. And we need to, if we're going to get greater justice and get greater outcomes uh, in the way the world really works, we need to have some adjustments. So can you tell us about this third world approach to uh, international law? Thank you. Uh, the third world approach to international law is basically a movement of le for legal recognition of equality and for... Uh, transforming international law to account for its past uh, historical baggage, because clearly... The equality of individuals, nations, what level of equality? Well, initially it started as a demand for uh, equality of nations. I see. As countries were becoming independent after colonialism ended in the 1940s and 50s, the leaders of those countries, as well as the legal uh, representatives of those countries, advocated for the fact that the inherited structure of international law was Eurocentric and colonial, and there is a need to reform international law to reflect the aspirations of the entire world. And that sentiment drove quite a lot of reform in international law over the years. And I would say even the recognition of economic, social, and cultural rights, for example, like housing or food, mm -hmm. were driven by the energy provided by this movement, particularly in the 1960s and 70s. But I think the way we talk about third world approaches in international law today is quite different. It's not about equality of nation states, but it's actually about the recognizing the agency of marginalized communities, oppressed people. So there can't, I mean, there, there, there can't be a greater case of need than Gaza or the Palestinian case, right? So when you look at economic, cultural, and social justice, how would the features of a third, third world understanding of international law change in a way? How... how could we move the needle on some of these important issues for people who feel demeaned, neglected, and kind of ignored, not, not, not just by the United States and others, but by, 
by everyone? That's a great but complex question as well, uh, in that, um, I mean, Palestine particularly is, a, is really an inherited problem from colonialism. Uh, in fact, during the 50s and 60s, when developing countries were recovering their voice and their agency, Palestine and apartheid South Africa were the two big, two big issues on the world agenda. Now, apartheid supposedly was ended in the early 90s, but unfortunately, the Palestinian situation continues. And what that means in terms of when you look at the Palestinian situation through a third world approach to international, what difference would it make, mm. as you asked? Well, the basic difference is to begin to see the condition and the suffering and what is needed for Palestinians in a different light from all the ways in which we have imagined it. For example, take something as fundamental to a Palestinian experience as Nakba. Mm. Does international have a language to talk about and understand Nakba? Mm. We can talk about occupation separately, but is Nakba the same as occupation? Many would say, well, it is, but it's much more than that. Nakba translates as catastrophe, mm -hmm. which is actually much more than occupation. Is it about apartheid alone? And many would say it is, but it is much more than that. And then now we have genocide happening in Gaza. So is Nakba really genocide? And I, perhaps yes, but perhaps more than that. It's a complex term, just like apartheid was a complex term. And the black South Africans and others who went through the apartheid system always wanted to have a new word called apartheid. Because no English word could capture the historical experience of what they went through under apartheid. I would say something similar, that in fact, no other people have gone through the historical experience that Palestinians have gone through. Mm. And that is captured by the term Nakba. But we don't have a way to talk about it in international law. And this is only one example. If you take occupation, for example, an occupation is supposed to be temporary. That's what international humanitarian law implicitly assumes any belligerent occupation. But you look at Israel's occupation of occupied Palestinian territories. It's been going on and on and on and on. And then slowly there is annexation happening, a bit here, a bit there, sending their settlers to appropriate lands, and then to remove the control of land and territory from Palestinians who already live there. Right. So this is actually, to me, a very different beast. And we need a new language. International doesn't have that language. Mm -hmm. A third world approach to international law, I would imagine, is at least capable of pointing to the fact that there are these gaps. Because you're not going to get that recognition when you view the Palestinian situation using inherited or traditional understandings of international law. Well, we'll end it there. UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing and MIT Associate Professor Balakrishnan Rajagopal, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So what's the bottom line? Domicide is a key tool to remove and extinguish a population from an area. We saw it in Aleppo, we saw it in Grozny and Mariupol, and now we're seeing it in Gaza. There is simply no excuse for the deliberate and determined destruction of nearly 70% of civilian infrastructure by Israel's forces in this conflict, other than engineering the permanent dislocation of Palestinians from the areas that have been obliterated. My guest today is right to argue that domicide should be considered a crime against humanity. But the cold reality is that no global or regional power is willing to constrain Israel from pursuing a path that has destroyed so many innocent lives and futures, which makes international law look pale and sickly in the moment it was needed most. And that's the bottom line.